Hello, 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 and welcome to the OB Boss Babes podcast, and welcome to the second annual Ottawa Valley Women's Collective in partnership with Local Immigration Partnership. My name is Holly Molinar, and I am the host and founder of the Ottawa Valley Boss Babes podcast, and most recently, Ottawa Valley Women in Business events. We hope that this is the last virtual event we hold, as we are greatly looking forward to hosting more events for women in business in person this year. Last year for International Women's Day, I met with several women across the Ottawa Valley for a panel discussion around how they were choosing to challenge. This year, we are breaking the bias on gender equality. Our moderator, Jody Buholtz from Local Immigration Partnership will be moderating a conversation with five diverse women from across the Ottawa Valley who will offer their personal stories and commentary on how we can positively move forward towards gender equality at home, in the workplace, and in our communities. Before we start, I'd like to thank our event sponsors for helping to make this event possible. Renfrew County Community Futures Development Corporation, Ottawa Valley Tourism Association, Petawawa Military Family Resource Center, Paro Center for Women Enterprise, the City of Pembroke, Laurentian Valley Township, the Town of Petawawa, and the Town of Renfrew. Now I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. So first we have Chris Kite. She is a Renfrew resident, a professional MC, and she has hosted confidence building workshops and is the founder of Renfrew Pride. Ellen Wong is a Petawawa resident, proud male spouse. She works at Algonquin College Waterfront Campus, and she has strongly been advocating for the creation of a diversity and inclusion committee within the town of Petawawa. Next, we have Karthi Rajamani, the CEO of the Pembroke Public Library. Carthy recently received the County of Renfrew's Warden's Community Service Award in 2021, and she also participates on the City of Pembroke's Diversity Advisory Committee. Amanda Martin lives in the town of Deep River, is a small business owner, has organized the We Are Women campaign to bring an end to period poverty, and is passionate about human rights. Finally, we have Sonia Bergen. She is originally from Renfrew, a committee member of the Renfrew Diversity Committee, was crowned Miss Teen Ontario East, and is a musician, photographer, and music teacher. Now I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Jody Buchholz, who's going to kickstart the conversation. So let's dive in. And um, we will go ahead and kickstart it. Jody, off with, uh, with the first question. I'm, before we get into the first questions, I am just going to take a moment to acknowledge that the event today is on unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people. And so uh, traditionally known as the Anishinaabe, Algonquin people are the original inhabitants of the area um, where we live, the beautiful Ottawa Valley. And so we want to respectfully thank the Algonquin people and we want to uh, acknowledge that they are hosting us on their ancestral land. So now we'll get into the questions. So we're here to talk about bias, gender bias. Does someone want to define gender bias for us? Um, I can do that because um, I am from, I was born and raised in India. I moved here as an immigrant when um, I was in the 30s, um, I can define the treatment uh, received based on real or perceived um, is bias, uh, you know, and um, based, uh, and being a, a girl growing up in India, uh, we are uh, not supposed to do certain things because uh, I'm a girl. I'm not supposed to ride a uh, bike uh, or go for swimming. I was not allowed in my days, but luckily I got married to a man who was uh, thinking women need to be independent and stand on their own feet. And he gave me full freedom to do what I want to do. And um, even he taught me how to ride a motorbike. Um, oh. I used to uh, ride a scooter back in India. Uh, I was the first woman um riding the uh, motorbike in my uh, hometown also uh, i was the first south indian lady who was uh, ri riding it in the place where we were living and i was uh, looked uh, by others like uh, i'm doing something wrong but i didn't wow. care and um, i broke the norms and uh, uh, usually men 
um, take the ladies at the back of their bike or scooter, whatever. But I used to take my husband at my back. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I, I was so proud of him giving me all the freedom. And uh, he didn't treat me like a lady. I shouldn't be doing this and that. And he gave me full freedom, including financial freedom. So I'm very grateful. Yeah. I, I knew you had a wild side to you. <laughs> That's so important, though, to have a partner who is going to support, um, you know, what, well, against gender biases, right? Like women in the kitchen and, and men doing outside things. And I feel like that's really important that you have somebody who understands that equality in households. Yes. Yeah. And was, I was not even allowed to go for swimming when my um uh, my parents said, oh, no, you cannot go for swimming. And I had three brothers and they, they all learned how to ride a bicycle and mm -hmm. uh, go, went for swimming and all that. I didn't get a chance. But after my marriage, I did everything I wanted to do. Oh, See, I, I grew up in a single parent household. I was raised by a mom. So there wasn't that gender role, that typical gender role, right? We did everything. We cut the grass, shoveled the driveway, unplugged the toilet. I helped her build a barbecue, put a lawnmower together. We didn't have that. So when I was growing up and people said, well, you can't do that, you're a girl. It was like, so what? You know, I played sports. I played baseball, volleyball, basketball. And I remember one time a guy saying to me, you throw like a girl. And I remember saying, I bet you, you wished you did too. Like it just wasn't something that I grew up with. So when I became a single mom raising my son, we didn't have those gender roles in our household because, you know, you did everything. Yeah. And now I'm in a same sex relationship. So again, gender roles have just never mm -hmm. been a part of my life. And I will be honest, it confuses me when I hear people say things like, well, here's the blue chore list and the pink chore list. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what are you talking about? So I had a very different experience than, than yourself. So yeah. I think also um, anybody who is a military spouse knows like there are not going to be roles that you don't do because your partner is away a lot of the time, right? Like um, if it's taking out the garbage, if it's snow blowing the driveway that are normally going to be a blue type of, of uh, chore in the house, you know, sometimes your partner is not there. And same goes for me. I travel. I'm, I'm a recruiter for a college, right? I get to travel all the time. I'm not there to do my husband's laundry and cook and clean every day. And that's really important is that we continue to, um, to break those biases in households because our children see that. And, Absolutely. you know, that's something you remember, you know, it, cooking is not women's work. <laughs> Doing the laundry is not women's work. That is a household responsibility that everybody shares. And because that's how I grew up. That's how I raised my son. And now my partner and I, we split responsibilities based on what we like to do. So I actually would be doing the, what used to be traditionally gender, uh, female roles. I love to cook. So I do the cooking because of my injury, she goes out and cuts the grass and, and snow blows or shovels because we're a same sex relationship. It's amazing the assumptions people put on us. Well, you're the female in the relationship. She's the male in the relationship. And that blows my mind that, that we have to pinpoint people into these gender roles, which in the LGBTQ community is why we feel so much backlash when you have non-binary or transgender individuals. It doesn't fit those here and here. And people's minds just kind of explode. I like how, so we've touched on pink and blue jobs. This, this was something that was in my life as well. And uh, I grew up on a, on a farm, I mean, on a dairy farm here in the Ottawa Valley. And um, I think that I was very, very aware of space defining gender bias at a young age because uh, on the farm, it didn't matter what gender you were. The expectation was that you were going to get the work done. Mm -hmm. If you had, you know, if you weren't physically capable of doing the work, you figured it out. Yes. And so having that in, in on the farm, but then in the home, that's where the pink and the blue jobs were. So, mm -hmm. you know, that you did the cooking, you did the cleaning, mm -hmm. but the expectation, as soon as you went outside, you're capable of cutting and splitting wood and piling it and, you know, throwing bales of hay and, and all of these things. And I just remember thinking, huh, this is interesting. Why, wh what's the difference between there and here? <coughs> That, that difference. So it, uh, it kind of made me smile a little bit when I heard the blue and pink yeah. jobs because that's exactly kind of how, how it was 
in the home, um, which is interesting. Um, so how do you, who do you think is responsible for taking action on women's issues? Is it everybody? Yeah, everybody. <laughs> and I think in terms of action, I think this is the type of action that is necessary to uh, not only have conversations like this, but also talk with young people about your experiences, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, a child that uh, is raised in a traditional household with a uh, division of uh, traditional responsibilities of uh, mother or father, if that is the, the dynamic in the household, uh, maybe they don't know anything else. And just to have that exposure and to have the understanding that uh, mm -hmm. not every household is the same and um, these household responsibilities um, are dependent on what your preferences are or what you're able to do or what you decide to divide up mm -hmm. um, between those members of the family. So I think that in terms of action, I think this is the type of action that needs to happen to share those stories, to talk with young people. And um, that's when we're able to sort of empower kids to think differently about uh, the ways in which they grow up and the things that they want to do um, in the house or at work or wherever. To add on that, gender studies doesn't usually show up in education, usually till college or university. Yeah. You might touch on it a little bit in sociology or something in high school. So maybe gender studies is something that should be introduced at a younger age. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we did have, um, and not to get into too many political sort of things, but we did have a sex education program in place mm -hmm. that would talk about gender idea, uh, identity and gender roles and such like this. And that just kind of got pushed to the side. But starting those conversations with children at an early age is really important. And if it's in school, mm -hmm. they're more open to accepting it because they were taught it. You know, and uh, I think that's something that we need to see is, is that education starting formally in the schools and then and carried on and like to these group conversations too. But yeah. if they actually, because I remember as a kid being in school and us girls, we went and played with the kitchen set and the dolls. I wasn't allowed to play with the trucks. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think so. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I received Barbie dolls as that's what we were taught. Yeah. yeah, you know, so yeah. my, my kid got Barbie dolls when he was a kid and Tonka mm -hmm. trucks. Barbie doll was a construction worker in our house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but I think the other thing is so I have a um a colleague that works closely with um diversity and inclusion and, and consulting, right? So she would go into firms and, and discuss how they can be more inclusive. And she said to me that once somebody who maybe doesn't fit in a certain area. So for example, uh, we talked about BIPOC. So we talked about being people of color, indigenous. And, and she said, the second that somebody outside of that BIPOC community stands up for that BIPOC community, that's really important. So yes, women need to come forward and, and talk about gender biases and issues. But at the same time, we also need those allies to come forward. Because if I'm sitting in a meeting and, you know, I'm nonstop talking about how it, it's really important for me um, to feel, you know, to, to feel good about the things that I'm doing, the second somebody else stands up, mm -hmm. that's when it really makes a difference. Because now you have your allies. And now it's not just you you know, going on and on about women's issues as a woman, yeah. but now when men and, and other people get involved, that's, that's crucial as well. I pay attention, especially on social media, when the men in my social media circle stand out as feminists who speak up for women's issues and speak out against violence against women and, and uh, speak up for rights for transgender women. Those men, I, we, we need to have our own voice. We need to be able to speak for ourselves and our allies should not be speaking for us. But when they come forward and say, oh, no, 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 this is what I support. They need to support it. Wow, it feels so, it feels like some of that load has been taken off my right. shoulders. And I think that's really important that men need to speak up on women's rights as well. Yeah. You know, when you look back at things like the vote, we wouldn't have received the vote. We wouldn't have been allowed to vote if, there weren't men who said, listen to what they're saying. Even you said yourself, it was your husband who said, no, no, no. She deserves to go for a swim. Swim, woman, swim. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, you said you couldn't swim. I swim three times a week. I have to. I was like, oh, you're not allowed to, you know? But again, as unfair as it is, it yeah. was a man who stepped forward and said, no, she has this right. Mm -hmm. This is 
It's yeah. a privilege. It's a right. And you're right. We need those yeah, allies. Yeah, allies need Men, if you're watching, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we act like we don't need you. <laughs> well, we definitely need the support I of like allies. To, yeah. I like to add something. And um, uh, uh, women need to speak for themselves mm -hmm. and come forward and uh, speak. And sometimes women are enemies for women. And uh, we have to break that. And if some, somebody is speaking up for themselves or doing something different than normal, we have to support them. Instead of uh, uh, pulling them backwards, mm -hmm. uh, we need to support them and encourage them to go forward. That's the point I like to say. And you're right. When I say that we, like, we need those allies, don't speak over us, but yeah. support, support us. us. Yeah. Give us space to say what we need to say. Yeah. So when you're when you're in a situation, so we've talked about we've touched on kids a little bit. When you're in a situation where somebody's a little older than you has some you know more traditional viewpoints, what uh, what do you think can be done in those situations to address the stereotypes that are ingrained in, in, in certain generations, ingrained in certain customs? That's tough, especially when it's cultural. No. It's like they say you're a product of your time. Yes. Yeah. Right? It's very hard to change people's opinions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think but you I have think, to tread so lightly too. But I think um, it's really important to be open-minded and, and yes. you know, like my grandmother. Um, so my grandfather was gay and, you know, back, back then didn't come out until much later. Um, but that perspective, and then she had mixed grandchildren. <laughs> so I feel like, um, she was very open-minded and accepting of like, um, you know, what was coming, like, like pride walks and, and pride parades and things like that. Like she was so supportive of it. And obviously hers was different because she went through an experience where, um, you know, like a family member did come out as gay, but at the same time, it's, it is hard to speak to an older group, you know, if they're not as open-minded, but I think just educating them. And if they meet, somebody like Chris for example and they're like wow we love Chris you know well Chris is part of the LGBTQ2S plus community and you know that makes her who she is mm -hmm. and you're an awesome person and I feel like you know when people meet you they might <laughs> look at it so differently because right, they're like yes. wow you are a great person yeah. you know sure. I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> but but I think they, like you know they need to go out take the time to meet people mm -hmm. and understand why it's so important yeah. to be inclusive and and to be proud of diversity because diversity brings new ideas to the table for people and it brings different perspectives I think there's two things that need to happen one, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quote Jill Hallroyd. She is from the County Key Flag. Amazing, amazingly patient, wonderful human being. I want to be like her when I grow up. And she once said, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. I'm 46 going on 12. It's true. Um, we have to meet people where they're at and bring them to where we need them to be. And I think the second part of that, um, the, the second thing we need to do is a huge part of that. We need to listen. We need to don't go in there and be like, okay, well, this is why you're wrong. You know, I deserve to be married to a woman or I deserve to have my voice heard. It's more like, okay, hold on. What, what is it that's holding you back? Like, what is it about this that bothers you so much? And listen, because if we come at them aggressive and, and like confrontational, they're going to shut down. They're not going to feel heard. They're going to get combative. So I think meeting them where they're at, listening to their concerns and having a conversation with them like we're all that we're not better than them yeah. you know what understanding I mean? why they understanding. Feel that way. Mm -hmm. because once you know why they think the way they think you might be able you'd have a better opportunity of possibly opening their mind I always tell people I'm not trying to change your mind I'm trying to open your mind yeah. and it could be a bias that they experienced or you know that they just believe it yeah and I mean again when I said it's a cultural thing I like I said I, I'm white I'm Irish um I'm LGBTQ 2s plus but I certainly wouldn't go to a BIPOC individual and say the way your culture treats you is wrong way to just insult their entire upbringing yeah. and that's where we have to be careful and I think another thing we need to to ask is well what would you like? What do you want? You know, um, there's no easy fix except for kindness and communication and being open to listening 
to why somebody is where they are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. I used to have really Thank you. great conversations with my, uh, with my nan. Uh, again, she was from a farm, you know, that farm lifestyle. And I used to always laugh because she would point out when I wasn't being very ladylike. And I, and, and again, we had such a wonderful relationship, like the very best. And I'd always laugh and be like, well, I haven't been really brought up as a lady because the expectation again is that I'm throwing hail, uh, hay bales and <laughs> shoveling poop. And, you know, like those aren't really ladylike things to do. Right? Yeah. You know, so uh, I'm a little bit of a tomboy, but, uh, you know, so but thanks for pointing it out, you know. Yeah. And, and again, we'd have those kind of, yes, so those, those, hard conversations around why do you think I need to be ladylike like yeah. I am I am who I am and and maybe I'm a little rough around the edges but uh you know I am I am a product of my environment well my grandma was the same way she's like you'd be a lady I and I used my grandma my grams and I we I loved her but we we would we would debate and argue and such, but she always wanted me to sit a certain way and wear certain things. So when I really want to drive her crazy, I'd flip that chair around backwards and straddle it. And throw <laughs> her. That, that's not how a lady sits. Well, it's a good thing I'm not a lady because she, and yeah, and, and you know, girls were to be demure. Have you met me? I am not demure. You know, uh, I was into sports. I was like, I am loud. And that was tough for my grandma because, you know, she wanted you to be, hello, yeah. dear. Like, it just, she was just so, you know, and I think, um, I think that's another thing that we fight is how we're raised and what we're supposed to do. And I went off on a tangent, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> got me thinking about my grandma. <laughs> so I had to say about my grandma, my grandma, she, 1930s, some type of uh, lady. And um, uh, I was growing up in 60s and 70s, and I like that's when uh, women started uh, liberation, mm -hmm. breathing on their own air type of thing. And uh, I used to be a little bit different than my crowd. And um, my grandma used to get nervous. Oh, why are you dressing up like this? No, you can't do that. Uh, but luckily, my mom, which she didn't have freedom with her mother, so she used to support me. No, no, she's doing good. And uh, she can dress up like that. She can go out and it's not uh, anything wrong she's doing. I'm not supposed to go out after five o'clock because when it is dark, uh, and again in India at that time, uh, girls, uh, it's not safe to go out. But I went anyways, but I was, uh, I was bold. Uh, uh, I put my feet and I, I stood for myself. And, uh, uh, but... Uh, my gra sometimes I think of my grandma, why don't you grow up? And <laughs> I used to fight with that. Why don't you grow up? Why don't you come to my uh, shoe and see? Nowadays, it's all changing. You have to accept how people are. Mm -hmm. And um, you can hold on to what you had. You have to let it go and uh, grow up with the... Um, with the evolution you have to change yeah, exactly. my, my grandmother so this is just a, a story just um based on uh, racism so my grandmother used to take us to dance classes and um this is my mom's mom so she is caucasian and there was one time where um, a lady was sitting in the dance class and watching the kids and she said to my grandmother oh i think that's the little half breed pointing at my sister not knowing like that's my grandmother. My grandmother stood up and said, that half breed is my granddaughter and walked out of that room. So I feel like, um, you know, coming from like just the background that we have of a multicultural family, you know, um, like that's really important that she should stood up and said that. And she's been with me several times where people are like, how is that your grandmother? She's white. And I'm like, how is that any of your business? Number one. And number two, like I'm mixed race. So you know, yeah. it's, yeah. And that's why I don't buy into the whole, it's their generation. Yeah. Maybe. You know, because I've, I've had conversations with individuals in, in their seventies and eighties who think like I do. Yeah. And then people my age are so narrow-minded and intolerant and unaccepting. So I don't buy into that generational crap. Yeah. I think that's saying that we're gently. Yeah. But a nice like point that you made is that 
we are conditioned to sort of um, have certain perspectives about what people should do based on their genders. And I think that uh, in connection to your point, we need to really encourage people to be self-advocates and, and express, like you said, what we want, what we want to do. And uh, at the end of the day, like uh, if, if someone wants to do something, if someone wants to be an engineer, but they're a female, do it. Uh, you know, if, if someone wants to be a teacher, but they're a male, do it. You know, like all these ideas and perceptions that people have of, of certain career paths even, um, just to encourage them to advocate for themselves and what they want mm -hmm. and, and pursue what they're passionate about. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's also really important. And um, I'm not trying to pull again, generation cards, but I remember a conversation a few years ago coming up on social media about pay equality. Mm -hmm. And there were um, young women who millennials who believed that pay equality existed were completely out of touch with what um, uh, unfairnesses still exist for women, like all women, transgender women, women, you know, like, I mean, they, they, they didn't know where they came from. They didn't know what was fought for. They didn't know that once upon a time, if they showed their ankles, they would have been called horrific names and scandalized mm -hmm. if they wore pets, heaven forbid. So I think that's important too, is, is learning, where we came from and what restrictions we used to have, you know, right down from fashion to rights to my grandmother was 15 years old before she was recognized as a human being in the eyes of the law. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that. And then, and there are, there are younger generations right now that don't know that once upon a time, they wouldn't have been able to own land. They didn't inherit their, their estates or, or their money they had, you know, and, and they equate a lot of that to to other cultures around the world and they oh that's so unfair I'm like but that used to exist here and if we're not careful if you don't learn the history yeah. you're going to let yourself be led right back to that kind mm -hmm. kind of thinking and I think that's really important is part of the education process you're talking yeah. about yeah. we need to 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 educate ourselves and educate mm -hmm. future generations what the past generations mm -hmm. fought for yeah. So that we could be sitting here today in pants, showing our ankles, yeah. showing our arms if we want. Like those were things that were not allowed. Yeah. And um, yeah, we drove here, we wouldn't have been able to drive. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, well, and I mean, back in the day, we'd all be here talking about our children and yeah. our households, and the men would be drinking their, you know, their brandy in the other room talking politics. We weren't even allowed to do that. Yeah. So understanding whatever, like what we've gained is really important. To move forward we don't want to dwell on the past but we need to learn from it mm -hmm. to move yes. forward and i think that's important too so. and so how do we how do we lobby for change like that because we've talked about the school systems we've talked about there being a lack of an opportunity at a young age for kids to to mm -hmm. learn how do we lobby for something like this the curriculum to actually be created and implemented i mean there was a you know pre-covid sort of COVID there was around sex education that was the you know the the, the roll back to uh, I think it was 20 year old curriculum mm -hmm. so if we've got if we've got an uh, Ontario school system that is using out-of-date sexual uh, education information how how do we get them to look at the need for the type of education necessary in the school system so that we have empowered boys and girls and non-binary kids mm -hmm. coming up in the world who, who know what the history is and who can move forward to have a voice and to demand equality. That's so looking at sex ed, like when I did it, we were split into groups, boys yeah. and girls. Boys didn't mm -hmm. learn about periods. That was a girl thing, right? And we're paying $6,000 like through our lifetimes for that supply of period products. So why don't boys have to learn about it? Yeah. You know, like why? We're it's a natural to, thing. That's how we reproduce. We're not supposed to talk about it. Exactly. It's taboo. Yeah. Like when I started doing stand up, we were told, uh, I was told, like, like as a female comic, there are certain things you don't make jokes about. And one of them was your periods. 
you don't talk about your period. So what do I do? <laughs> I get up on stage and I say, so I'm not supposed to talk about my period because guys, it makes you uncomfortable. But you'll watch the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan over and over again. I live it every single month. <laughs> there's bleeding, there's bloating, and there's a little crying, let's be honest. Because oh, it's, it's yeah. you know, it's we're so embarrassed nice. if we get a spot of blood on our, our bed sheets. These are things that need to be normalized. Yeah. And, and, and that's important. And you're right. I'm so glad you brought that up because I haven't had a good period of talking forever. <laughs> I remember being in high school and I was on the phone talking about how I hadn't had my period for like seven weeks. And I was really like, I, I knew I wasn't pregnant. I was still a virgin, but I got off the phone and I was like, well, who are you talking to? And I told her the guy's name I was talking to. She's like, <laughs> you were talking about your period with a man, like with a boy? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, why not? He talks, tells me when he was actually like kicked in the, you know, in the groin. Mm -hmm. So when I raised my son, I raised him to be comfortable enough to go to a store and pick up pads or tampons or, you mm -hmm. know, and you're right. We were separated mm -hmm. um, in high school, in, in, in uh, elementary school, we were kind of all together, but they didn't talk about periods. It was in our gym class. Yeah. Our female gym class. Right. This is stuff that needs to be, because now when you talk transgender, Men have periods too. So this is this is something. Oh, it's a great time to bring this up. There's there's a small initiative or or larger initiative going right now to change it from feminine hygiene products to menstruation products. Okay. Because yeah. men have periods too, and that makes people go, "What?" Yeah. But you know, if if someone is transgender and identifies as male but hasn't had any kind of surgery, yes, they're going to have periods. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we need, yeah, normal. Or we can just call them pads and tampons. Exactly. Well, yes. They're called condoms. Like, why can't yeah. we just be like, those are foods. <laughs> yes. Tampons, we need them. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, to, yeah. So I do want to know a little bit, Mindy, you ran the We Are Women yeah. uh, campaign. Uh, this seems like an appropriate time <laughs> for you to share a little bit about, about, uh, about that campaign. So I started it back in the, December like just to coincide with Christmas and everyone's in a giving mood um I used it with my bakery so I have my bakery and I have my business but I want to use it to spread good mm -hmm. so we collected about fifteen hundred dollars worth of menstruation products for people with uteruses that can't afford those period products Wow. Amazing. so and we donated them to the Deep River Food Bank the reason why I started it was because I saw they were in need yeah. And then it got me thinking, I'm like, wow, like, I remember there was a time in my life when I couldn't afford it. Like, was it gas or was it yeah. like yeah. to get tampons, you know? Yeah. And, and there even, is, there is an initiative called Tampon Tuesday. And I remember bringing it up at a work meeting, our Monday morning meeting, and they all burst out laughing. And I'm yeah. like, why do we find this so childlike? Yeah. Funny. Was, it, was it tampon or Tuesday that they found funny? I think it was the Tuesday. <laughs> okay. I, think it was Tuesday. I think they would have been more receptive if it was tampon Wednesday. You know? <laughs> Freak out. So, uh, no, but it was, little, yeah. But the time. fact that we have people who cannot afford and have to choose between menstruation products and, you know, being able to travel somewhere, even going to work. So uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a huge percentage. I can't remember now, so I don't want to quote it wrong, Yeah. but that we miss school, work, social events due to our periods. Yeah. Like, because yeah. there's a, those of us that suffer from endometriosis, yeah. fibroids, PCOS, endymosis, yeah. um, just even dysmenorrhea, like it's severe and it's not talked about enough. Yeah. So we get isolated and, and we're alone. I hate is it that time of the month for you? Because oh you're, gosh, yeah. as soon as a woman, as soon as a woman gets feisty, yeah. like to say feisty, is it that time of the month? No, but it's going to be your time of funeral. Like seriously. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it, I remember missing school because my periods were so excruciating. Yeah. I would vomit. I had diarrhea. These are other lovely topics. Um, and I couldn't walk because the pain yeah. was so bad. And my mom, even my mom didn't even understand. She's like, come on, walk it off. Until one day she came in and I was literally curled up in the tub with the wa water as hot as I could stand it in a fetal position crying because the pain was that bad. My mom's periods weren't like that. She couldn't, yeah. she couldn't empathize. So yeah, I missed school. I've missed, uh, I've missed work. And it's because, you know, people think, oh, it's just a little bit of bleeding. Oh, no, <laughs> our whole hormones are out of whack. And, 
it, it's and for some people it's nothing and for other people it's like get out of my way like it's bad yeah, yeah. well so, so I, I, oh, I, go ahead. I like to share something here um when i was growing up by, back in india um when girl got that those days they are not allowed to go inside the house and touch certain things and uh, um they are separated but uh, in certain communities they are separated but my house it's not uh, and i wouldn't listen if it is uh, and um but i love you <laughs> <laughs> but they uh, were restricted not to touch uh, um certain things yeah. okay and um for example uh, certain food and uh, um where we keep the guard type of yeah. thing but i was not going to listen all those things i touched every single thing <laughs> 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 I make sure I didn't follow the rules. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, so I was very supportive of for somebody uh, going through the, this kind of pain or anything. Mm. I understand. I help them and uh, I don't want any lady to go through uh, separation from yeah. the real world uh, for those three days and uh, separated from the mm-hmm. world. Wow. Uh, that's kind of uh, crazy. those time yeah. well I, yeah. i remember reading a book in in high school we had to read i can't remember the name of it and um i couldn't believe this actually happened in in places of the world uh in this particular um village of this culture and i'm not going to even try to remember where i want to say it was in the continent of africa but when the women got their period they went to the bleeding hut mm-hmm. and they were they stayed there the entire time yeah. and i can't imagine being separated from your family and not allowed to be around men or your children or anything like that because of a natural bodily function mm-hmm. you know and yeah. there's more of us in the world like let's be honest like there should be bigger conversations about this but i yeah and it would you never talked about it you, you still don't you still don't i have been going to doctors for 22 years It's just a painful period you'll get over it don't even be started just a on a painful period that's another thing women are not taken seriously we are jumping all over the place from our poor moderator but <laughs> that's another thing women have a tough time being taken seriously at a doctor a doctor's office as well for a variety of reasons oh it's just your age oh it's just your weight we're not listened to mm-hmm. and uh, these are things that need to be uh communicated and and changed yeah yeah preach <laughs> yeah, I, i i i just and we're written off as you know oh which like you said it's just your period oh it's just this oh it's just like the trees women your, as society. society oh it's like women are weak women are oversensitive or emotional but it's like try going through that when you have pain so bad that you can't leave your house or you know. I gave birth to a 10 pound child naturally <laughs> you cannot call me weak yeah. <laughs> I actually had to quit my job because of my endometriosis oh. yeah you know and I'm still waiting covid right to yeah. get in to see a specialist I was I had a medical event 2 years ago and I was told if this, this had been 5 years ago I probably would have been turned away and went home Wow. and it was a serious one where i had ended up in the hospital in ottawa wow. so it's because of the my cardiologist she's female and because of her research in ottawa is the reason why i was recognized with a heart attack wow i was on a run yeah yeah well and heart attacks manifest differently in us yes, yes. yeah you know? and that mine was called scad like i have scad yeah. disease so because of her research her intern was the one that went she had she's probably had a scad like she needs to come to ottawa oh, now wow and so if 5 years ago though i would have been like mm, it's probably just your anxiety go home and take an out of it yeah yeah wow yeah. so in and in those cases where where you're emotional where you're expressing yourself no matter where doctor's mm-hmm. office workplace and and ellen like you said that that's seen as a as a sign of weakness yeah. that negative impact in that space where you're at like how do you think that men and women in their expression of their emotions play a role in violating the stereotypes that that we're experiencing that we're each of us have experienced around 
you're, you know, you're just having a, a day. You're on your period. Um, you're feeling emotional because I, I feel like we could just say man cold like you know there's <laughs> like trick. oh sorry right right okay. like I, I'll I, call them out yeah I feel like it's like women are weak because you are having like your period whatever but if you've ever like sorry to my husband also if you've ever uh you know seen a man with a man cold <laughs> and we and we joke about that and that's just another like bias where it's like you know you have a man cold whatever but um but it does really portray women as weak if we, you know, need that time. And yeah. And yeah. And all those, those terms that people often associate with women, there's been a lot of research done with even children yeah. and identifying, okay, if you see um, this woman here in this position, what are the adjectives that you would describe her as? And like we were saying, these more uh, negative or like mm -hmm. um, aggressive, emotional, Whereas on the flip side, hysterical. yeah, mm -hmm. hysterical. And then, and then we've got different uh, adjectives for men. Uh, men. Yeah. And sensitive. But, but Sen I think, yeah, I yeah. think it's also like women need to support other women, you know, like, yeah. so, yes. so for, for a long time, like, and if you work in a workplace where, you know, you could take a sick leave or you take, you know, that 18 months off on maternity leave and things like that. But when other women judge other women about that, that, yeah. you know, is a really negative impact because other people see that and, and maybe men in the workplace see that. And, you know, like at the same time, we need to support other women, mm -hmm. um, especially in the workplace. Yeah. If my colleague calls me and says, you know, I have to take a day off because of menstruation pains, I'm not going to go and be like, oh my gosh, guess what? Like, oh my gosh, she's like, that's her period. You know, but, but it's just so important to provide that support to yeah. your colleagues and say yeah. like, I'm here with you and you know even if I've never experienced that mm -hmm. like you need to be understanding to those people do do we need to call it what it is then do we need to start to to be more transparent saying instead of saying you know I'm I'm taking a sick day and just kind of leaving it that I'm not feeling well I've got a little bit of headache being like I'm taking a sick day because my period is unbearable or and again I know that 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 might come across as being a little maybe unprofessional depending on who you're saying it to yeah but really just like calling it out to say mm -hmm. I'm calling this what it is mm -hmm. I need a day and yeah maybe I, that is what it is is it's like you're open about it like yeah. I'm taking a period day I would <laughs> love to call into work and say I'm surfing the crimson wave <laughs> I'll see you in two days like, and flow is staying like you know what I mean like I, that, that would be awesome <laughs> And actually, you know what, and, and that goes back to whole work thing. We shouldn't even have to say anything for any reason. I'm not coming in today. I'm sick. It's all yeah, yeah. I think most workplaces are right. yeah. normalizing. But talking about women turning on women, we live in a culture that has been very carefully crafted to keep us um, at odds with each other. Uh -huh. Because, um, and I'm, I, first of all, I'd like to say for a long time, I thought feminist was a dirty word. I was like, I'm not a feminist, I'm an equalitist, because apparently that's a word. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't understand what feminine, what feminism was until about maybe 10 years ago when I started paying attention. So, and so my, my people might say, this is the angry feminist in me, but we, we've been, we live in a culture and a society where it only, um, I want to use this word, behooves. <laughs> you don't know what it means, but I like how it sounds. Um, it's to men's advantage that we don't get along. We're constantly compared to each other. Yeah, our intelligence, yeah. our beauty. You know, we have been taught to, if I'm, if I'm a professional woman, I've been taught to judge <coughs> the woman who decides to live the traditional role of staying home and taking care of her husband and her children. The woman who decides to be a stay-at-home mom has been taught to um, look down on the woman who's at work and not there for her kids all of the time. We are pitted against each other because it makes us easy to manipulate. And I say that because I don't get to talk about this often. <laughs> Prior to the introduction of certain religions, without getting into religion, we had a large matriarchal society around the world. Women were the cultural leaders. We were the spiritual leaders. We were the political leaders. That's why certain religions have worked very, very hard to diminish our importance, our intelligence, and our role in society. And we have been taught 
to be catty with each other Mm -hmm. instead of supporting each other. So when we put other women down for what they wear, you want to wear a mini skirt that shows me your thong, go for it, lady. I love it. Do it. Do what you want. Wear what you want to wear. But we have been taught to judge each other based on what we wear and how we act. If we are sexually active, well, now, I don't know if I could say this, we're sluts. You know, if we're wearing the wrong kind of clothes, you know how many women I have heard say, well, she's asking for it. Ugh, Did that come so from your mouth? Don't yeah. even. But that's how we mm. have been taught. We've been yeah. taught to judge each other because if we ever got our act together and mm. supported each other and grew together and stood together, the powers that be that benefit from us being easy to manipulate would be ter- they don't want that they'd be terrified so that's why it's so important that we put an end to this gender bias the newest thing is the turfs the trans exclusive radical feminist because as soon as we as women welcome transgender women into our fold and support them we've just strengthened our resolve we are pitted against each other yeah and the sooner we see that and put an end to it the more we're going to see our world change Mm -hmm. and more doors open for us, more rights for us. We're going to have more women in places of power. We're going to have little girls who see a woman run for president and not be called horrible names by some man who's afraid of her. Chris for president. (laughs) Yeah. You got it. But I think like don't on that too, like mothers also um like that happens a lot with motherhood right it's mm-hmm. like if you don't breastfeed well now your kid doesn't have you know certain antibodies and, and they're not close it, to them yeah and if you like formula feed and you know and like you said stay-at-home mom not stay-at-home moms and it's or like it's it's heaven not forbid, forbid comparison or heaven forbid choose not to be a mother okay that's a big one like topic, that's a big yeah. one yeah <laughs> we're like yeah judge yeah judge <laughs> if you choose not to be yeah. a mother yeah you'll change your mind oh or maybe when well, you meet the right but person you'd be such a good mom yeah. such they'll a be good lonely mom. Well, or do you think it's selfish of you you should <laughs> not bring a life into this world i'm sorry have you met this world like <laughs> there but no one says that to men no one ever says that. No one ever asks a man, like, when are you having babies? Oh, do you plan on going back to work when you're a child this morning? Um, but, but I think, like, so I remember when we got married. Sorry, a little aggression. But I got married four years ago. Someone wrote in our guest book, have lots of babies. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, someone wrote this in my wedding guest book. Like, we had just gotten married. And I think, like, it's a never-ending, like, okay, you start dating somebody. When are you getting engaged? Well, when are you getting married? When are you having kids? When's your next kid? Okay, now when's retirement? Like, it's like a non-stop like, I would have pressure wrote, on women. Make each other laugh. That's yeah. what you write in those and, things. And women, like, now what's happening is, like, we spend a lot more time in post-secondary education, right? You know, a lot of us go to school for, you know, college and university and, and uh, getting master's and PhDs. I work with a lot of very educated women that have their, their PhDs, and they've had children later. And it's like, well, if, if you don't have kids before you're 30, it's going to be a lot harder. And that's a pressure that is really put on women from society. Yeah. Timelines. I, I was, I was 19 and in college when I surprised you're going to have a baby. Like I, it wasn't planned. It wasn't, wasn't planned. Love them dearly would never change a thing. And I had them when I was 20 and I had them when I was young. Um, but then it was like, well, are you going to marry the father? Like it just, it was the, yeah. the expectation mm-hmm. on us and the assumptions of single moms. Mm-hmm. But the dad was probably told by his family, well, now you have to marry her. No, well, well no, they didn't okay, know yet. He, okay. the, the conversation went, oh, okay, I'll marry you. And I'm like, we'd broken up a week before. And I, I said, for me or, or for the baby? And he said, well, for the baby. I said, no, I deserve better than that. The baby deserves better than that. Yeah. And my family was like, what? you chose not to get married, uh, divorced, divorced, shot. We're good. Like <laughs> you did not make good choices. This was a choice I made. And even my partner, my partner is much younger than I am. Uh, she's closer to my son's age. She's just mine. But anyway, she's 28 and she's already feeling that pressure of, well, we should have children soon. I, do you want to have kids? Do you really want to have kids? Or do you think you're supposed to have kids? But it's a societal mm-hmm. pressure. Well, she stopped and went, um, uh, well, am I not supposed to want to be a mom? Yeah. I'm like, well, you need to think about that. Like, I'm good for it. You're chasing the kids. You're younger. But she had to stop and think. Yeah. 
is it because I want to, or because I feel like I'm supposed to. And it's that timeline that people put on women. It's mm-hmm. like after, and, and I can't remember if it's, if it's 35 or 34, but it's like after that you're considered to like, geriatric. Be, yeah, like it's a geriatric pregnancy. And it's like, 34 years old if you want to become a doctor you're just starting out your life if you have done you know eight years of school or five years of school you're just starting out your career and then all of a sudden it's like having to think about um you know leaving that career or taking time off when you know you work so hard to get there the only timeline that counts is the biological one yeah you know if there's dust on the eggs maybe not so much ready to have a kid kind of thing but that that is that is the pressure to to oh and to meet the right guy Mm-hmm. you know that's all I ever heard when you meet the right guy apparently my right guy has a vagina I was not prepared <laughs> for that I wasn't told at a young age do you have a girlfriend yet like I, I'm pansexual like I was never in a in a closet or anything like that but women it's all about do you remember there was a time sorry now I'm all over the place there was a time when the only reason women went to college was to find a husband oh my gosh our worth is so tied up into our our husbands and our children and the big question that we're always asked that men are never asked, well, how do you plan on juggling children and your career? So yeah. let, let's dive into that a little bit deeper. So pregnancy work, do you think that employers are, are biased or hold women back when they get pregnant? Like, oh. you know, having to raise young kids. What do you, what do you think about that? I, I, Finding think that balance? I think it's like, okay. So number one, we talked about, you know, you spend longer time in school or, or maybe you want to do like upgrading and things like that. But I think it's, it's like an unintentional way of being held back where it's like, you know, now we can take 18 months off, 18 months off of work is a long time, you know, Mm -hmm. and does that hold women back if they take 18 months? It could Mm -hmm. potentially, they might be missing out on different opportunities in the workplace. Um, but I, I think it definitely does happen, whether it's like intentional or not intentional. It's just like, because women are expected to take that time. And, And if we lived in the States, you literally get like six Six weeks weeks. off and it's like, you're back at work, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I think number one, we are lucky in Canada that we can take the time that we need off, but I think it definitely could have impacts on our, on our work, Mm -hmm. but there has been some forward movement. It's now parental leave. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's great. And and split it. Your parents, I almost said husband, the other parent can take time off as well, which is just as important. I think it really depends on the workplace. This is not something I can comment too strongly because I was in the middle of college when I had my son and then I was a single mom. So like I worked, 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 but I had a job where I worked in the evening from four until nine o'clock at night. My son was, I don't know, 11 or 12. He would come there and have dinner with me. Oh. My workplace, it was the rec center here in town. That was cool. Yeah. They'd like, yeah, he can come. He could come shoot hoops if he wanted to. So that was a, an inclusive and um, flexible workplace. Um, at the radio station, would my son have been able to come in while I was doing the live weather? I don't know. But what was really cool, it doesn't answer the question, but I have to share this. I was interviewing someone and they nursed their child during the interview. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and I was amazing. like, this is a cool experience. So I think it would be, I think it depends on the workplace, that particular question. Mm -hmm. And I'm not one who can, can comment to that. I I would like to think that there's more, um, actually I can't speak to my workplace a bit because there are moms in our workplace who have had to take uh, time off, even just when their kids are sick. Mm -hmm. And, And does that affect promotions? Like, does that affect, you know, what if, what if you're the mom who question. is always taking time off to, for appointments, P, PD days? Do you think that's frowned upon by employers? Oh. See, once again, I think women need to support women. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. like, it's okay if, like, my colleague needs a day off because their kid is sick. Like, I'm not going to judge that person. But I think a lot of people have that mentality where it's like, like, she has kids. Like, just because I don't have kids, like you know, and and like with COVID, there just been so many issues around it where it's like, okay, now kids have to be at home from homeschool and like, who's going to be doing that. And if you have to isolate and I just feel like when women support other women, that's how we break that bias against, um, you know, stigma of like, oh, that person's missing work again because their kid is sick. I think the employer plays a role in that too, though. Yeah. Because I have a friend right now who does not have children. Has elderly parents who are unwell 
And when they have to work on the weekend, um, I'm not naming the place or any or the person, but when they have to work on the weekend, um, certain people won't be there. And my friend will be like, well, how come they're not here? Well, they have kids. My mom has breast cancer. My father has this. And so she doesn't get the same freedom as the people with kids. So that makes her resentful Mm -hmm. towards people with kids. So I think the employer plays a role in that as well. But um, I can speak again uh, to, I will say my FM um, because our boss has kids and his wife is a professional. She's a teacher. And there were times he couldn't come into the office because of his kids. So he has more empathy and understanding Mm -hmm. to the parents in our building and I'm going to say it that way because sometimes it's the dad that's got to go and you know so I think in that regard employers can take the lead and implement change and a healthier environment they have the power to remove that toxicity that pits parents against Mm non-parents and that's really important I think it could be like like using your own sick days where like if your child is sick right or like having a personal day or you know whether they can add it and I work in a unionized area right so you know we're very open we're very you know like there's no questions asked if you need the day like you need the day and that's you know it's a really positive environment um so I think but but they have made that positive environment Mm because once again a lot of our managers have children a lot of the um the managers are professional women and and you know it's And I think that's the argument for promoting women. I remember doing a story on CNL, at the time it was AECL, and it was a program that they had created in Chalk River where they helped train women so they could be at the position they needed to be to get the promotion, right? Because there's that argument, oh, she's just promoted because she's just a woman, like they need more women. Well, no, they'd make sure that they had the skills and the tools. Because it was their belief that when you saw women uh, succeed and excel in a career, it encouraged other women to participate yeah. and or to to um, not participate, but to strive for those goals. Um, so I think that's also important. This is why it's so crucial. Visibility representation matters. Mm-hmm. Women need to be in these positions to show the younger generations that they can do it. You know, and I think that's really, really important. Um, in regards to the workplace and eliminating these issues for parents and for women is to get more women up into positions of authority in places where they can make change. Yeah. And something to be better for the workplace. I would like to add to this in my, my workplace. So one of the employee has a younger child and we were all uh, always supportive whenever she takes off for the sake of something. And, uh, so we have to be supportive of other women, mm-hmm. then only we can go forward mm-hmm. and uh, break this bias. Yeah. And, and Karthi, so you're, you're in a, you're the CEO of the Pembroke Public Library mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, librarians are, are kind of seen as a, as a, a female female role. Yes. <laughs> what are you doing at the library to, to address the, a little bit of a counter bias? And um, we have one employee, male employee, and whenever possible, I'm recruiting the students, uh, uh, employees, male, and uh, I like to break the bias because uh, predominantly library librarians are all women, and uh, I like to break that. <laughs> and um, so I have currently I have two male employees uh, at the workplace. Good for you. Uh, COVID. We're like, I feel <laughs> like we are almost at the end of it. I feel like it. I also feel like I might have just jinxed us. Yeah, we don't don't know. Because <laughs> I feel like we, we were almost there before. But do you, so so talking about pregnancies, talking about uh, moms, dads, do you think that women have been disproportionately affected uh, over the last two years with COVID and, and work, life, everything balanced? What's the last uh, two years so. been like? I think so. Like um, when a child has the sniffles and can't go to school, I can speak to a particular family without naming names. They're divorced, shared custody. And when the mom has the custody and there's sniffles, like she'll stay home. Whereas he goes to work and gets another family member to come in and look after. So I think that it may have had an impact. I think that there's 
an automatic expectation that the moms will be the ones mm -hmm. that, you know, walk away from their career for the day because there's been this cultural pressure that men's careers, they're the breadwinners, they're, they're more important than the women in the workplace. Plus as moms, we feel like bad moms, we're not there for our kids. And you know what I mean? Like, I know if I ever had to go to work and had to send my son to my mom's, I was like, I should be looking after my son, but I don't get paid if I don't go. And then we don't eat and that's a whole other problem. <laughs> but I, 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 well, first of all, I have, I have a son, you don't have children. I'm not trying to out anybody. I want to know like, if, if there's other. I'm not trying to out anybody. Oh my god! I I don't want to speak on behalf of our moms. <laughs> right. See, I knew this was gonna happen. Fur babies count, like yeah, fur babies yeah. absolutely count. Yeah. They get sick. See, okay, I told well, you yes. upstairs oh, I was gonna do something stupid. Oh, the foot, the size twelve foot, was gonna go in the mouth. Um, I think. Um, I think, yeah, there has been an impact. And because a lot of, not all, but the majority of single parents are moms as well. Yeah, but but I think also like the whole um, having to do school online, yeah. oh. like somebody has to be home. Yeah. So, so, you know, when we started working remotely, a lot of people, you know, struggled with, okay, I have to be on my kids' Zoom or Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. I have to be on my own meetings. I have to get my work done. On and, rural internet. Yeah, rural internet. But but I wrote down a couple of things that like really affected women during COVID. And I think um, domestic abuse yes. and violence yes. also, yes. right? Because we're, no yeah, and we don't see each other, right? So we don't, we might not see those impacts of abuse or we might not see the signs. Mm -hmm. And uh, And how do you escape that when you're isolated? Right. So there was that sign, and I can't remember it, so I'm not going to do it, but it was developed by someone in yeah, Canada. Yeah. 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 Or and the text. Used. Or, or some people had had like codes where it was like, text me and ask me about the makeup that I sell uh -huh. because like, I don't sell makeup, but I'll know that you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's uh, like women have been really impacted by COVID. Um, and it's like, yeah, now your kids are home all day. Now you, you know, are doing chores and you're doing all these things in the home. And your kids are still there and you're still working and, and because women might experience pay gap, maybe, you know, their job is not as important because they make less than what their partner might make, you know? So touching based on that, because we immediately focused on moms and working, talking about COVID and struggles that women had, absolutely the abuse, addictions. Mm -hmm. We don't have addictions programs in this community for women. We don't really have, we have McKay Manor for men. Uh, they're working on trying to get a women's um, addictions residential home up and running because a lot of women won't come forward about their addictions because they're afraid they'll lose their children. That's another thing that's yeah. a huge issue for women. But during COVID, those support groups were gone. You know, um, mm -hmm one-on-one -on -one sessions well, even everybody then, has access to internet or like virtual exactly like to men, tools, yeah mental health yeah mm -hmm. you know like I, I i know for a fact that people you know they're couldn't have one-on-one -on -one with their therapist so COVID actually impacted women and it impacted a lot of people in a lot of ways mm -hmm. when you look at women in regards to violence against women and addictions they were cut off yeah. from any supports they had mm -hmm. And yeah, I would say that it's definitely- And even children, like at that yes. point with, with violence, right? My sister's a, uh, a social worker and she said like, you know, if, if the children are at home and it's isolated and, you know, there's domestic abuse and things like that, it really affects them. They take a look at places that close down, restaurants and stores where the majority of their staff are women, are moms, exactly. you know, didn't have money coming in yeah. until CERB, thank goodness for CERB. And CERB actually worked in favor for a lot of these uh, folks that end up being off work because they're getting for the first time more money in a month yeah. and they had to stay at home with their kids to do homeschool <laughs> yeah you, you really stuck on that I, I'm really stuck on it because I saw a lot of mm. uh it, like issues with like <laughs> kids like parents having to like log into these classes with their kids and I remember one day like my my niece um her daycare was closed so she uh went to my dad's house and my dad and her logged into the class yeah and they're like cutting like, snowflakes and things like that. She's kindergarten. And like, he's sitting there like, and he's retired and, you know, it was a little bit different, but if my sister was taking time off and, he, and she doesn't want her to fall behind at all, mm -hmm. but like taking time off and, you know, my, she wasn't getting involved with like the social skills and those types of things, but moms were expected yes. to like sit at home and, and essentially help teach their children. 
there reason. is some days still squeezes the eight hours of work. Yeah, right? and, and make the meal and, and yeah. do the laundry. Do the laundry and and do you're, your... you're getting emails at yeah. you know midnight, one, two in yeah. the morning because yeah. that's the only time yeah. that a lot of women have the opportunity to to get to the work. That yeah. is still an expectation. I say expectation loosely, but it's still. Yeah. Uh, maybe a sense of responsibility to get it done yeah. but I think we just like weren't prepared like COVID like just hit so hard and it's like okay everybody's working from home okay like now we have to like adapt our our jobs to be able to work from home and the only reason why I laughed and I apologize I have to explain <laughs> is because my mom looks after my nephews my mom is 67 pretty much computer illiterate like she's not good at, and here she is trying to help my nephews with their homeschooling yeah. and she's calling me make the program work I'm like yeah. I don't even know what it is you know so here's my mom every time they talked about in like at home oh you know, online goodness. learning my mom was like there's a new gray like she just couldn't yeah. you know and then, and again you've got parents who might not uh, like you said, they don't have internet or they're out like somewhere where they don't. Or they're healthcare workers that still have oh, to go in. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah. so I'm going to say yes. Yeah. Short answer. Yes. 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 So, yeah. COVID definitely has impacted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's shift to pay equity. Um, oh. Deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> so years and years and years, women have had to advocate their skills. They've had to, you know, reinforce their years of experience. They've had to negotiate their salary wages. How do you think employers can promote gender equality in the workplace around wage transparency? Has anyone experienced wage gaps? And uh, we had wage gaps in the past, but the uh, employer implemented the pay equity. So now we are all good. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it uh, went very well, uh, um, but we have to speak up for that. So, why do we have to speak up for it? Uh, because why do we have uh, to ask for it? Uh, it was not uh, um, followed, uh, kept up. Uh, mm -hmm. So many years before they did pay equity. After that, it was not. Uh, uh, we have to maintain the pay equity. Yeah. Uh, it was lost uh, because a lot of work involved. And uh, um, those who are in a leadership position, they need to take uh, charge and do it, but it was not done, but uh, um, I took a lead and uh, we did it. And so yeah. ended up uh, happy remember, ending. Do you remember Carthy in 2018, the pay, the equal pay for equal work? I don't know if anybody remembers when the, when the provincial government came out with that mandate and, and where I worked, the college, like we um, had all these people who ended up you know, receiving um, their equal pay and the college kept that in place even though the government actually got rid of wow. that. Yeah, so wow. a lot of places, they were able to do the equal pay for equal work. Okay. Everybody um, was at the right pay at that point and then the college kept it on. So um, when we have like new employees there, if it's a part-time job, mm -hmm. it'll be compared to a full-time job and that kind of was our mm -hmm. um, our pay equity. So we don't really, because we're unionized, uh -huh. um, yeah. we're in a very fair workplace where our pay is updated and and you know there's not a lot of biases around it but but it used to be part-time versus full-time mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and Joni knows you know we we worked together and uh and then what happened was equal pay came in and the colleges kept continuing with that even though the government got rid of that mandate and we do have our uh, equal pay for part-time and uh, yeah. Full -time. yeah yeah yeah, we do yes. have that. I think that's why we're seeing huge I mean I'm addressing you with this because I think it's where we see a huge um new crop of female entrepreneurs mm -hmm. because that eliminates that you've got your own business mm -hmm. like is it let me ask is that oh, sorry i'm taking your job <laughs> was that a driving point for starting your own but like was that something that yes. impacted your so, decision i'm from alberta and i worked actually with the health union there for almost 10 years so it's very fair like yeah unions are bad. Bad. i've had people before me fight for that Yes. Right. Nurses stood up and fought for us. So there has to be credit given where it's due. Um, but coming here, it's actually a huge page decrease from what I was making in Alberta to here in healthcare. So I was like, I'm going to do what I want to do and what I'm passionate about. I'm going to quit where I was and I'm going to start something new. So I did it. It's been hard, but yeah. Well, I think we have to take a look because you said, why do we have to ask for it or why mm. do we have to fight for it? I think, again, it goes back to understanding where we came from. 
why do women get paid less? Because at one point we entered the workforce and there was resentment there. We weren't welcomed into the workforce. We weren't wanted there, you know? And so it was like, let's make it as difficult for them as possible. So they're going to want to go back home where they belong. And I remember uh, a few months ago, I I would, I put on nine to five, the movie (laughs) hadn't watched it in forever. And I was like, Oh my gosh, when I first watched this, this was the norm in the workplace. We didn't see anything wrong with what was happening. That was actually considered quite progressive when it came out. And I remember when, you know, after they captured him, tied him up in his room and all that, and that, you know, for those who don't know, the women started making the decisions for the boss that <laughs> disappeared. And the company blossomed with child care and, uh, allowing women to leave when they needed to, you know, having different shifts and stuff like that. And they uh, incorporated pay increase and the bosses were so happy, except for that uh, gender equality pay. I'm not on board with that. We're going to put an end to that. Right. That was in the movie. And that's where it came from was discouraging us from the workforce but now we are a huge part of the workforce. We're driving part of the workforce, but that old mentality is still there. And there are always going to be people who try to explain it away, you know, and we do it to ourselves. I was like, I um, worked a job and someone got hired after me, how many years after me doing the same job, but was only paid and I had been there for years and years, but only got paid like $1,500 a year less than I was getting. And I explained it away as, Oh, they've got education in that field, but I have way more experience. And so right there is fair to say it was a gender thing, but how do I prove it? Yeah. Yeah. And also the pay equity is not only doing one time, it has to be maintained yes. over the period of time. And uh, it's a lot of work. Um, those who are in leadership position, they have to take lead and uh, maintain that. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. on, on that point, um, what's the one thing that you've seen locally in your experience of, of companies who are walking the talk, that they are stepping up and they are providing and I would say equity. library. Library. Yes. Yeah. And um, so we maintain the pay equity and all the time. If there is a job description changes, I make sure uh, the position is getting paid uh, in a fair way Com- uh, compared to the comparative, male comparative. And um, so always uh, make sure it's happening. Hopefully it happen in the future too after I leave. And uh, I make plans. Uh, so I'm hoping that will continue. Yeah. And I hope to see like the government has a bill out right now where um, publicly funded organizations and, and positions can only receive a 1% increase um, on certain benefits and, and pay. And we see a lot, a lot of that right now with nurses, mm-hmm. uh, which is also one of those jobs that is a primarily yeah. um, female dominated industry. But a lot of people don't know that that actually also affects teachers which also is mm-hmm. a, you know, female dominant. female dominant industry. It affects, um, like myself, working at, in post-secondary institutions. So um, hopefully, um, you know, that bill will not stay around. But right now, um, those industries can only receive a 1% increase, what? which... Yeah, yeah, that's what's about. So, so wait, this is in Ontario. I have yes. This. Yeah, it's so. And and what's happening is so that's why um like there was such a healthcare shortage because a lot of healthcare workers could only receive that one percent. But it's also affecting schools and anything else. Is it funded. like a cola you're talking? Yeah, they reduced it like because normally the cost of living adjustment is two percent. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's one percent. Yeah. So what's help. happening is like someone like myself, like if I'm at the top of a pay band, like the only thing we could ever receive is 1% more, but it also affects benefits. So for example, if you receive, let's say a thousand, thousand dollars, a little bit, a lot for classes, $500 a year, you can only receive, like when you renegotiate your contracts and things, you can only receive a 1% higher than what it was. So the cost of living is, is a lot. And then there's a lot of these um, female, in, like female dominant industries that mm-hmm. They can only receive a small increase. Yeah, it's a really big thing. I would like to do credit to them. It's like 
Yeah. Yeah. Like, if you get, yeah. Yeah. like if you get to five years, the cost of living has gone up 10%, but yeah, but you get one five percent, you get half that. Yeah, so yeah, you get one percent every year. Yeah. But it's very like it really affects a lot of industries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like to give credit to uh, Pembroke, uh, City of Pembroke and Council. Um, and whatever male comparator for the uh, library employees get, we get it. Yeah, so all this, uh, nothing changed. Yeah, and same with Algonquin College, like I said, we have a really equal um, pay because once again, we are unionized and they did stick with the equal pay, equal work. And yeah. they continued that, right? And so. the board kept, uh, kept up with the city and yeah. um, I would thank board for that. And um, so there is no um, difference in the pay for the male comparator and for the library employees. So it yes. sounds like there's a lot of employers in the area who are walking the talk, which is, uh, which is really great to hear. Yeah. What about human rights committees? Um, I know, I think a couple of you maybe that have experienced human rights committees uh, in your workplace. I don't think, I don't think the college, like they don't advertise like a specific committee but we are very strong in human rights because we deal with students with disabilities we deal with a lot of different things where it is a human right to have access to those services so um we do have an edi committee so we do have an equity diversity inclusion committee which i sit on um but i'm not sure about like a specific human rights group but we do follow all the mandates and i looked up in some of our human resources policies and we actually include um include those in a lot of our policies. Um, I know that uh, when my FM grew big enough, because we have stations all over Ontario, uh, we hit over 100 employees because we're federally mandated. We had to have an employment equity committee. And I, and I sat on it uh, for when we met and such, and it basically just took a look at um, do we have barriers in place for people with disabilities, LGBTQ, 2S+, no. uh, BIPOC, that sort of thing. So, um, and also, tried to identify, do we have members of those marginalized groups in our employment and do they have what they need? You know, so I think the biggest barrier that would have ever been in our station, especially uh, in Renfrew, would have been for uh, accessibility. You know, so what I mean? yeah. because I mean, I've been off now for almost two years because I'm waiting on a hip replacement. So I have mobility issues. The washroom is upstairs. <laughs> or downstairs you know it's an older building and that's something that i think my fm is looking at improving as we move forward right now in our rent for office we don't have anybody who is in a wheelchair but i know in one of our other stations we did and they remodeled to make sure there was accessibility so um we do have an employment equity um committee within our employment mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. to ensure that um, there is no dis discrimination and such like that. And eventually we also mm -hmm. had to take <laughs> uh, courses and training um, on gender equality and racism and things like that. So, and, and there were people in our workplace because our workplace was predominantly Caucasian. We didn't have a whole lot of BIPOC. Mm -hmm. I know I'm like the LGBTQ represents kind of thing. <laughs> um so a lot of times we we're reading these things going well you know this 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 couldn't happen because it never happened to us mm -hmm. but now we've been aware that it could happen to a marginalized person who worked with us so yeah and there's so, a lot of grants now like to make buildings accessible too like, yeah. you know when when we built our new campus um we received grants to be able to like every one of our doors is wheelchair accessible. We've got the bathrooms that are wheelchair accessible and things like that. Well, I think Ontario has a goal to be completely accessible by a certain date. I thought it was this year. I thought it was yeah, this year too, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, so. Um, but I would say that there's still, around accessibility, there's still, there's some really kind of staple spaces that still aren't quite on the radar yet. So like breastfeeding stations, yes. prayer rooms, things like mm -hmm. that. We did actually, so our EDI committee, um, we did come up with like a couple of different proposals, but we do have a student who, um, or a few students who use a prayer room and generally they're Muslim students. So depending on the time of the day, mm -hmm. like there's students that are using it now, which is great. That's yeah. awesome. Um, we talk about, and I, I'm probably jumping a wee bit here, but we're talking about accessibility and putting things in place to make everybody feel included. Um, my brother fought for them to put a changing station in the men's room 
at the Horton Community Center. Okay, that's important. Like, and so when we talk about breaking bias and gender equality, everybody just thinks, oh, women, they want everything. Once equality is there for us, it's there for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, there are single dads out there. There are hands-on dads out there. They need a place to take their children to, to feed them. Might not be breastfeeding, but take them someplace. There are private. families with two dads. You know, exactly. Uh, and non-binary parents exactly. and transgender parents. Like our world mm -hmm. and how we look and who we are is changing. Mm -hmm. And we need to get our butt in gear to change with it. Um, but yeah, I think that's what breaking the bias. We've been talking about all the issues for women, transgender women included. But breaking those bias can only benefit everybody because this is my favorite saying right now as soon as you try to stand up for somebody's rights and somebody gets all ruffled about it this is not pie we are not pie there is enough for everybody just because this person is getting a bigger slice than they used to doesn't mean we're necessarily giving you less mm. but it's perceived that way because there are people who definitely benefit and profit from keeping those biases firmly intact in place and in play and those are the folks that are going to fight tooth and nail and they might be the folks that use derogatory terms mm. has anybody experienced any derogatory remarks <laughs> honey dear sex bang. yeah oh i love the oh you're one of those women that wear sensible shoes <laughs> okay. My response, oh, because you, lesbians. I'm not a lesbian, but lesbians wear sensible shoes. Oh, okay. my response is, well, why wouldn't I wear sensible shoes? Like, you know, but that's oh gosh, if I'm in a debate one. with someone on social media and they go to my profile to creep me and they see a picture of me and my girlfriend, oh, you're one of those. <laughs> I'm sorry, one of what? Like, you know, so yeah, I've had stuff um, thrown at me. I've had people because and this is another thing with being a woman when you're debating on social media i'm suddenly hysterical calm down there sweetie i'm sorry i'm not worked up i'm sitting here eating you know my carrot sticks while i'm correcting your fake information kind of thing right we we get <laughs> giggling. we've all been accused of it and when we were talking about this earlier i wanted to mention this i'm sorry for dominating so much of the conversation but even the term hysteria and hysterectomy sounds so close why we were given women were given hysterectomies when we were hysterical yeah. because it was believed at the time that our wounds were wandering our body because we didn't have a child or this or that. Oh so goodness. that's why hysteria is tied in with hysterectomy, why they, they come from the same root word, because we're hysterical. Therefore, take out their uterus. <laughs> no, you oh want to make God, me hysterical? You. Take out my uterus. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know where it's going with that, but I just had to share that little bit of information. I learned that in psychology. <laughs> Or smile. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It'll, if you smile, you'll look prettier. Yeah. Oh, I, I wrote down a stat. Drives me nuts. I wrote down a stat and it was so 28% of women in Canada experience non consensual touching in the workplace. Yes. And 89% of it say they avoid, um, they avoid like taking steps to, to mm -hmm. make those changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it happens. I think in terms of, um, like, the names like honey or sweet for, for me personally it, it it i think it depends it's a gray area mm -hmm. if it's something that i feel is happening too consistently and it's making me uncomfortable that's when i would feel like this, this is not okay mm -hmm. um, but i've also seen it like i'd be out with my partner and i would observe a cashier for example calling him honey or mm -hmm. hun and that doesn't bother me context is huge yeah Context is yeah. huge and personal comfort is huge. Right. Yeah. yeah. So my partner gets more, it becomes uncomfortable far quicker than I do. You call me sweetum. You call me, mm -hmm. I got called Dame once. I'm like, we are in the 1930s. <laughs> you know, <laughs> those things don't bother me because what about, that's my What about ma'am? Oh, no, I, I corrected someone once who did that. I was like, I'm, yeah. like, I'm, I'm 30 years old. Like, yeah. <laughs> what I do when they were so offended that I yeah. corrected them. I tell all of them now, especially if they're guys, I'm like, listen, 
doesn't matter if they're nine or if they're 99, call them miss, they'll blush. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. all want to be missed, you know, I would, ma'am is a term of endearment, but she'll get more offended if someone were to say honey or dear or tell her an inappropriate joke. Whereas I will probably laugh my butt off and be upset yeah. that I didn't think of it first. Yeah. So I do understand how difficult it is for people to navigate because some people are okay with it. Some people are not. Well, if there's a, even the slightest chance that somebody might not be okay with it, maybe don't say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Know your audience, know who you're talking to. If you know me and you know, I appreciate a dirty joke. Well, and you're a comedian, me. right? Like you are, you I have, know. yeah, I can, ha- I can take it. Like, um, talking about inappropriate comments. I want to go back when I worked at McDonald's, there was someone who worked there in a position of authority, when we would crouch or kneel to stop the milk fridge, he would grab his pants and hitch it and say, while you're down there. (gasps) This is not okay. Right. (laughs) Yeah. My response always was, get me a magnifying glass and some tweezers and I'll see if I can find it. Didn't bother me. I could hold Mm -hmm. my own. He didn't intimidate me. Other girls made them very uncomfortable. He said this to teenage girls. So these are the kinds of things when you do react, they're like, oh my, get a sense of humor. I was only kidding. Mm -hmm. That is what we're up against are these types of jokes and inappropriate comments. And when we react. And I I think uh, I have a personal story or uh, experience of, um, I guess you could call it sexual um, uh, harassment. And like a matter of feeling comfortable enough to report. And, mm-hmm. and I think that sometimes maybe there's a gray area of it's, well, it was a joke that the person made up or, oh, wasn't that serious? Um, I experienced uh, a time when I was in college of walking off campus, uh, somebody that was working um, on the roof, I guess some sort of repair had uh, sort of uh, cat called me, I guess you could say howled or whatever and it caught me off guard nobody was around but it was sort of embarrassing to Mm -hmm. be called out like that and and my mentality was if I go home I get into my car I go home and I do nothing about this Mm -hmm. what if this person thinks that it's okay to touch somebody Mm -hmm. without their consent or if they go to uh let's say a bar and and they Mm -hmm. cross a line you know like to what point is it uh, not okay? So I, I decided to do something about it. And, and um, in terms of people taking it serious, it was taken very, very seriously. And I think that um, it's important that people uh, know that they need to behave in, in, in certain ways and have expectations placed upon them. So, uh, you know, in terms of making certain jokes that are inappropriate work, people should know that the policy is, and there should be a policy in place, yeah. that you shouldn't go there. And you we, shouldn't even well, make there, people feel there's comfortable. There's a lot of three years, years ago. There's a lot of like workplace policies now yeah. on sexual yeah. harassment yeah. And, and reporting and that things stay confidential. And, yeah. and it's you know, unfortunate that it takes something happening for these to be implemented, mm-hmm. right? And it, it comes from the whole, um, we we we're supposed to be flattered by these comments. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, now I've never really experienced it, and I think it's because it looks I look like I could turn around and put you on your butt if you you know did something to me, like said something, right? Maybe not with my cane. I mean, the cane can be intimidating too. But <laughs> I had a conversation um, with two. Were you there? Was it you? Not I was speaking with at the fairgrounds one day Maybe. with, um, oh, 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 I'm forgetting her name. Anyway, we were chatting and I said, the big issue is women are sexual beings, but we're treated like sexual objects. objects. Yes. I was going to say that. Yeah. Like in India, we were, well, women are look like a sec- sexual objects, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, um, um, I like to share something here. And um, when you travel in the night in the bus, uh, like uh, I lived in almost uh, 10 hours journey from my hometown, um, going the bu- in the bus, men sit at the back and they'll be kicking you in the back. Uh, and uh, what I do is I take my pin, say to my pin, <laughs> poke it on their feet. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I love you. You're like my new hero. <laughs> yeah. So on their toes, yeah. so they kick with the toe 
and I poke it, then they don't even turn me my side. <laughs> So I'd like to add to the conversation. Um, I, I, I'm an avid runner. Like I slowed down a lot COVID, but yeah. um, I was actually out on a run in Edmonton and in the river Valley. And I had my dog with me. I always took my dog because it was a safety thing. And I've always, like, I'm a girl. I shouldn't run alone. And I was, even though I had my dog, I was actually surrounded by a group of men and they are harassing me. And what saved me was my dog, wow. yeah. you know, and I was harassed. I was cat called. I was like so many terrible things, but not to like call it these women or anything, but there was two women watching while this happened. But, and I was so upset, but you know, think it's probably because they were scared. Mm -hmm. Like what, like what would have happened? Mm -hmm. You know, there's like group of five men. So not, it was like five or six men surrounding me. And I'm like, where do I go? Yeah. You know, and these two women are watching and I did call the police, but they're like, well, what can we do now? Yeah. Well, like, so with the Me Too movement, do you think that there's, that women are feeling more comfortable no. in, no, in, in reporting Absolutely. harassment? No. no. It's like, Who I are the Turner. Like, this, no. like, argument gets me heated. Mm. Brock Turner. Oh. He was no. caught in the act. Three yeah. sexual assaults. What? He spent, like, six months in jail. Yeah. With that? Trigger warning. White male. Trigger warning. He was a white man. Yeah. And just recently, I can't remember his name, but I wish I could. And he got up, the judge just let him free. Yeah. Overturned his conviction. One judge what said, one judge said to a victim, couldn't you have crossed your legs? That was here in Canada. Oh, we, yeah. the, the, so when it comes to trigger warning, trigger warning, when it comes to sexual assault uh, with women, we're the only victims of a crime that were asked, what did we do wrong? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now I am very open about my life and my experiences. And I was uh, sexually assaulted when I was 11. And it's a sad day and age when I say the words, I'm lucky I was 11 because I was believe I'm believed. Mm -hmm. At what age, I say to people, well, at what age do you stop believing people? Mm -hmm. yeah. what you know, wearing? do you start but, just start? But I think, I think also, oh, if, are you drinking? If, yeah. you, if you do report something, number one, it is a trauma. Okay. So mm -hmm. you've experienced a trauma. Number two, you arrive at the hospital, you get, you know, it, it's just like going, yeah. Like it's just another trauma where it's like the rape hit and it's, you know, having to relive that story. And I watched a documentary where a young girl did go through a sexual assault and literally had to tell her story five or six mm -hmm. times, you know, different officers and they're mm -hmm. writing it down every time. And you yeah. remember your information. Yeah. And you're reliving mm -hmm. that trauma over and over. So sometimes um, people might feel it's best just to not do it because they don't want to have to go through that side of it. Also, um, because of the trauma, things happen to the brain and yeah. you don't remember things. So I don't remember his name. I don't remember the time of the year, but I can tell you what was playing on the radio. Yeah. I can tell you what his couch looked like, you know? So that's the other thing is um, our legal system needs to have a thorough overhauling and understanding of trauma. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, Gamesh, Gamesh, yeah, Gamesh. What was, yeah, Gia. yeah Gamesh. okay. So everybody's like, well, why did you go back to his house? You need to understand mm -hmm. the trauma that women or individuals feel, the people feel once this happens to them. And, um, and, and that kind of, for lack of a better word, twisted connection to, to their predator well and i think our, our bodies naturally um when you're experiencing a trauma there is a time where you know there could be periods where it's like a blackout you know you're Did that, or, or it's an out of yeah or it's an out of body experience where like you're not there but you're watching it happen and and naturally we do that when we're experiencing a trauma also is did I did I remember like what, was I mistaken yeah because that's what that was one of her one of the victim's comments mm -hmm. was like yeah I went back because I thought maybe I misunderstood yeah you know and I mean let's face it when these sorts of things happen certain things are said to you I was made to feel like it was my fault I was in love then yeah. you know so that's another thing that uh women um cisgender and transgender deal with is it is the one crime where they are made to feel like they've done something wrong yeah. you know if you got mugged well were you wearing that expensive watch why did you wear that expensive uh, watch yeah. in that back out it's your fault did like, you have money in your 
pocket what you know and i oh i get so angry with the were you drinking Mm -hmm. who cares and when they do go on trial their whole sexual past is brought up which is why it's so important that we need to normalize women as sexual beings and not not sexual sexual objects objects. because uh, a trigger get a trigger warning because a lot of people don't like this word rape culture exists there was a meme on facebook years ago it still circulates every now and then and it's a split picture between a woman wearing work pants and um, she has knee pads on and she's wearing a cat shirt, right? Like the, the brand name cats. The, and then on the next panel, it says, oh, two can play this game. And it's a cat wearing a t-shirt that says whore. Okay. And people are sharing that and they think it's funny. And I remember sharing it and saying, okay, so what, about this picture made her a whore was it the fact that all of her skin was covered was it the dirty knees like and it and that is it was a woman who shared it and this is why it's important that we put an end to this sort of thing yeah because that right there perpetrates red culture just because she was a woman she was a whore and everybody thought that was funny that a cat was wearing it these are the things that need to change so that people start taking women seriously when they report yeah wow you go you look at the and then the iw two-spirited mm-hmm. like that's a huge yeah. issue oh, all in its yeah. own but missing and murdered indigenous women is just it's out of this world of how indigenous women are treated mm-hmm. like and that's like it's unreal. And I just, I can't fathom that idea of saying to someone, well, what are you going to do? And we, we created a culture where that was, it seems to be okay. This happens Mm -hmm. to indigenous women, because we are talking about a country that really needs to take a look at its history when it comes to indigenous individuals. But the fact that indigenous women to this day, uh, maybe not right now, but in the last year or two, we're still sterilized against their will. Mm-hmm. We don't see them as individuals. We don't see them as people. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying we, I mean, collective we. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's you see it in BIPOC communities and LGBTQ2S plus communities. Um, we're not seen as some somebody that matters. And you're right, it is in, like we can go back hundreds of years. Like I'm a registered Alberta Métis. So you look at my great, great, great grandmother, her husband died and he was Scottish and she was Métis, you know, and she just got pushed, pushed out of her land. Mm -hmm. But that still happens. Yeah. And this is at the end of the, what, late 1800s? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, you know, and it's still happening, maybe not pushed out of your land, but women of indigenous culture are still being like still having to fight for those extra rights that Mm -hmm. I identify as white you know I am Métis but my skin is white so I have that privilege yeah of just like not having to think twice about it Mm -hmm. it's unfortunate I'm trying to be better about it but and I think the term is because I have a friend who is BIPOC and says passes as white Mm -hmm. there's no question you know what I mean yes um, and I mean, yes, I'm LGBTQ2S plus, but you don't know that by looking at me. So I have a, a privilege that someone who has um, a visible difference. Yeah. You know what I mean? And even in my community, I had somebody say, you don't look gay. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. Uh, yeah. But you look be- like you wear some cool shoes. I do. Look- <laughs> <laughs> I have a bad hip. Of course, I look like I wear some yeah, cool shoes. Yeah. But like my partner, she has all the piercings. She has the piercings. She has the short, spiky hair. Like you, you, I was guilty of it too. Looking at and women like her, and I picture she's gay. Yeah. You know, so people were like, well, "I look like a lesbian." I'm like, "Well, I'm sorry. What does that look like? I'm not wearing my patch today." And like, <laughs> you know, so I have um, that privilege. Also, with being LGBTQ2S plus, um, I was never in the closet. This when I started dating my girlfriend, a lot of people asked me, "Well, when did you realize you were gay?" I'm not gay. 
Yeah. And pansexual. Yeah. When did you come out of the closet? I was never in the closet. Yeah. I never, I, I never really, like, I knew I was attracted to women and I knew I was attracted to different people. I was assumed I was going to be with a guy. I never had any reason to live my life sheltered. So as being the founder of Red for Pride, sometimes I feel like a fraud because I don't have the same experiences as other people in my community do, because I've never been afraid to be who I am. I was 40 three when I met her and she was like well what if what if your family I'm like I'm 43 years old I've been single for 24 years I'm just lucky my heart still beats like that's all anybody's gonna be worried about is that I'm not dead inside I lived too much of my life to care what people thought I realized that gives me a unique opportunity to be a voice for my community because I haven't had that beat down that bullying that closeted experience that makes me afraid to speak out yeah and so I see that now as a responsibility to speak out and I think I think what you're saying too is important where everybody has different privileges right Mm -hmm. so yes I identify as a person of color um but I'm mixed so there's there's two different areas right and and you know I'm married to a man and I haven't gone through certain things that some people in our LGBTQ2S plus community have gone through mm-hmm. and I have a friend who we did a presentation with the town of Petawawa and when we when we chatted you know she um, she's gay and I'm not we just said we both have really different privileges and that's why we came together to hopefully start a committee because we are coming from two different backgrounds but mm-hmm. that's beautiful about diversity is that people can share their backgrounds and bring their perceptions and their ideas forward that we might not have thought about because we don't have that the same background as everybody. Exactly. Well, an advocacy and, and an inclusive mindset are, are, as well as tangible action, are, yeah. are really needed in the community. I think we can all agree on that. And several of you sit on uh, diversity and inclusion committees. So what, what work is being done in those meetings right now? And um, Pembroke is very active in the diversity committee. And um, uh, I think um, um, Evan's uh, dad, he's uh, chairing the committee Mm -hmm. and um, they are really working uh, hard and going forward with uh, so many different things and creating visibility in the community. Mm -hmm. And also um, uh, I sit on the committee as a member and um, through different activities and programs and events. We are um, libraries doing its job to create awareness in the community for the diversity and inclusion. And um, I'm the la- library, we do the Pride Week and um, um, Black History Month and also Multicultural Festival and all those things. Mm-hmm. And um, because of that, uh, um, library gets a very important place in the diversity committee and um, they are doing a great job and going forward creating visibility and uh, uh, making an inclusive place uh, uh, Pembroke uh, that's what they are trying to do and um, I would like to say diversity uh, brings the prosperity to the community and um, so we all have to work towards uh, inclusiveness and um, bringing diversity to our community to uh, make a great prosperity for this uh, uh, Redford County. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I sit on the um, Algonquin College EDI committee. So mm-hmm. there's a certain amount of us. Um, we have students, staff, we have teachers. So it's a really diverse group. And we discuss a lot of different topics and issues, not only in our community, but in our college community. Okay. So some of the things that we've created, we've created a diversity and inclusion uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, um, comment box where people can actually submit, um, ideas or issues that are coming up. Uh-huh. We've also created, um, land claim acknowledgements. Yeah. Um, we've done a lot of stuff. I mean, we've only been active for a few months, but, um, we're also reviewing policies. We're reviewing, you know, even access to healthcare for some of our transgender students that might not have doctors in the area to be able to provide them with, with certain referrals. Um, but yeah, we're working on that. I And I am trying to start one in Petawawa as well, um, because I just think it's really important. Petawawa is a very diverse community. We have hundreds of people moving in and out every year due to military. And I think it's really important that um, we grow we grow those committees and that all areas in Renfrew County and most workplaces have these. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sonia, I think you're, you're on the Renfrew um, ad hoc committee, right? Yeah. Um, and I guess sort of the reason why I was passionate about pursuing 
the committee was because I'm also uh, uh, Filipino and French Canadian. And my mother, she came to Canada when she was about my age. Um, and she has experienced a few different instances of, of racism or discrimination. Um, one in particular, when I was very small, it was just uh, when the new No Frills had opened up in Renfrew and somebody told her to go back to her country for whatever reason, which um, as far as I was aware, and now I'm especially aware, Canada is a, um, a diverse uh, country and we are open and accepting of all different uh, cultures and ethnicities. So um, it is all of our country, uh, but anyway, so in terms of um, our committee here in Renfrew, things sort of uh, have, I guess, dwindled a little bit. And uh, I think that perhaps uh, a couple of struggles uh, uh, were sort of um, not knowing where to start or feeling like the issue is so overwhelming and um, where should we be taking action first uh, in education, uh, within small businesses or large companies uh, and uh, sort of, I guess, disappointing. Um, and I almost feel like uh, not only is a committee or some sort of organization important to have, uh, but also to uh, encourage individual people to, to, to have that conversation about diversity and inclusion. Uh, for example, for me, I remember one instance where I was working at a day camp and I was talking about, for whatever reason, uh, culture and, and immigration with one uh, child. And I just brought up the conversation of my mother is from the Philippines, my father is from Canada. And I think that that dialogue is really important to just to sort of normalize that conversation rather than, uh, you know, for example, skin color being something that is uh, uncomfortable to talk about, talk about our heritage uh, where you've come from, whether your ancestors came from uh, Europe or, or elsewhere, just to, to have those conversations on an individual basis, I feel like is powerful, not as powerful um, without a committee uh, pertaining to diversity and inclusion. So I think that that's really important. I hope that, hope that moving forward, uh, maybe uh, that spark of passion will be sort of ignited again. Um, perhaps with the help of all of you to sort of get things back on track. But uh, I know that a lot of people are passionate about, about the topic and are passionate about being inclusive and, and welcoming and, and, and educated about diversity and inclusion. So I think it's just a matter of, of um, having that conversation again and, and making sure that the conversation continues um, and that, that things uh, happen. So. Well, and, and um, I too sit on the uh, Pembroke Diversity and Inclusivity um, Advisory Committee uh, as my as part of my work with Local Immigration Partnership and the, the great work that was being is being done with that committee. Um, I approached the city to say, you know, I think that there's you you folks are this is an exemplar here, and uh, said, you know, I think that there is a lot of information that can be shared with all of the municipalities mm -hmm. to say. This is what's been done to date. I'm not saying it's perfect, but this is a model that can be followed, yeah, a model that, that has been successful and that um, uh, can be used to, to start up. And, and yeah. so Local Immigration Partnership in, in uh, partnership with the city of Pembroke, we created a little how-to guide to create your own EDI committee. And so, you know, how, and, and some of the terms of reference from the uh, Algonquin College Pembroke campus are in there and just kind of a starter package so that there's a little bit of a guide because it's scary. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. there's a fear of a misstep and yeah. the misstep in yeah. these instances is not stepping. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, that's true. true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of municipalities are missing out on like grant pieces, right? Like there are certain grants in Canada that you can apply for if you're trying to build equity, diversity and inclusion within communities. So okay. it's not just about uh, like, and, and yes, they can be expensive if there's certain things, you know, Pembroke did the diversity garden and a, a lot of different activities, reviewing some of the murals and, and approving, you know, indigenous artwork within the city. But, um, but there are grants because this is something that's really, really important to promote. I think too, 
um, and I don't want to speak out of turn here, but it's, it's, and if I'm wrong, I know people will correct me, but like you said, Renfrew's has kind of gone quiet. Um, and I know that one of the big uh, <clears throat> proponents and one of the, one of the people that really pushed for this has moved to another town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what's important about these diversity committees is that the responsibility is not so set so heavily on the shoulders of the people you're trying to support. Yeah. It shouldn't be BIPOC and LGBTQ that puts in all the work. It's the allies. It's the allies that need to do this because um, I'm not speaking so much for myself because we've just established that I haven't experienced a lot of this, but a lot of members of the marginalized communities are just trying to survive day to day. It is not their job to teach us, you know, and, and make the changes for us. It is our job to educate ourselves and to learn and to put in the work. We can't turn to a member of BIPOC or LGBTQ2S and say, okay, tell us what to do. Yeah. What do we need to do to change? I know right now you're, you're dealing with systemic racism and um, homophobia and transphobia, but fix us, please, please fix us. But that's why it's we not how it works. That's why we don't ask indigenous members of our community yeah. to do land acknowledgements yeah. because mm -hmm. it's on the allies and it's on other people to be able to acknowledge that. And I think the first thing that needs to be done, um, I'm speaking for Renfrew because I live here, is to acknowledge that there are biases here, gender, systemic racism, because uh, we were talking about Roe, she was part of an article along with some other individuals talking about their racism experiences. Do you know many people came to me and said, well, there's no racism. If she was experiencing racism, why didn't she tell somebody? She is, <laughs> and you're still not listening. Yeah. So that's the first thing that needs to happen <laughs> is that as a community, we have to acknowledge that we have, we have growing to do, we have changing to do, we have educating to do. I think people take it very personally when they're told there's misogyny, racism, homophobia, transphobia. They're like, but that's not me. We're not saying it's you. We're saying it's ingrained in our communities mm -hmm. and you need to. And, and the other word that people are really stuck on is privilege. Well, I don't have money. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily what privilege means. It's understanding that um, my, the best analogy was a teacher came into the classroom, put a wastebasket in yes. front of the class yeah, and all the kids that. had to ball up their paper and throw it. The people in the front row had no problem making the basket. The people in the middle, a little harder. The people at the back barely made the basket. It wasn't that the people in the front were better basketball players. They just had the privilege of being closer to the mm -hmm. basket. Yeah. That's what privilege is, is that, yes, your life was tough, but it wasn't made tough by your skin color yeah. or your orientation or identity. And that is a huge obstacle for the diversity committees to face in their communities. Yeah. So as we creep up to three o'clock here, um, I have, have a pretty big question for each of you. Um, so everyone plays a role in forging um, gender parity. How do you think you're making a difference? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> I, I think essentially what it comes down to for any societal issue is to be kind, to encourage others to be kind, to critically think, to be open-minded and encourage others to do the same. And I think um, if, if everyone was able to be open-minded, was encouraged to be kind and wanted to be kind, none of these issues would exist. We wouldn't care what other people decide to do with their lives, who they want to be with, what they choose to do as a career. And I think that, I think maybe I kind of live in like the fantasy world of wishing that everyone was open-minded and kind and inclusive and, and, you know, more concerned about developing themselves personally and just trying to, to make a positive contribution to, to the world. I think that's, that's the solution that I, that I foresee being effective in addition to everything else that's being done. But that for me, that's like at the top of, at the top of the, the list, which I don't necessarily know if it's realistic. Um, for everyone to be exactly that way, 
just because mm-hmm. we're conditioned and you know we've had life experiences and and I think that if we can just encourage people to be kind and if we can be kind and spread that kindness which sounds terribly corny um that is when we can make a more inclusive and positive community and and world for everyone to exist in yeah i think first off we have to recognize how the bias works in our favor acknowledge that um Mm -hmm. own that accept that i think uh, for me personally one of the biggest achievements was raising my son to be a feminist without even trying. Um, I think that role modeling, uh, living what we're talking about, you know, um, being what, being that change we want to see in the world. Again, we're going to those corny cliche sayings, being the change you want to see in the world. And most recently for me, with everything that's happening in the world right now, uh, and in our own backyard kind of thing in Ottawa, I had shared a post and it was um, an Indigenous mind thought of what are my obligations, not what are my rights. And that actually created a debate on my page. I've been shifting my thinking to what are my obligations to my community and to mankind as opposed to what are my rights? Because as soon as we fulfill our obligations to our community and to mankind, those rights will just naturally be met. So like, oh, well, that's, yeah. that's good. Oh, that's good. I would say my piece is like advocacy. So continuing to be active in my community, be active in my workplace, um, and educating others about why this is so important, um, whether it's diversity, whether it's you know gender biases and issues that, that come up. Um, but I will continue to be involved. I will continue to be a voice, and I will continue to stand up for others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would like to add uh, the change has to uh, come from within us, but, mm-hmm. and we have to be uh, bias free. And uh, we have to, um, for example, uh, uh, when my son got married, I told him, You are not getting your mother, you are getting your partner. And uh, you have to share everything with your, uh, all the chores you have mm-hmm. to share. So, like that, it has to start from mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. to make changes. And um, even at home, uh, at an, uh, in the workplace, um, <clears throat> we have to be a um, change makers. I will leave it with that. Well, uh, before we close today's event, I want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge Ottawa Valley's awesome and ultimate boss babe, Holly. <laughs> Thank you. Behind today's event, and of course, the hall and the other Holly, the other talented Holly Alert from the AJ Video Productions for capturing today's important dialogue. And I would also like to acknowledge that this is probably the most people that I've been in a room with in quite some time. And I feel so privileged to have spent the last two hours with each and every one of you. I am grateful for all of your candor and uh, for sharing your thoughts on today's Break the Bias. Because Dodie used on my other side today. <laughs> I love that side. <laughs> I'm just flipping my camera around. Um, I know I'm not looking at you guys individually. I'm looking at my audience here, but I would like to thank everyone that participated today. Jody, I cannot thank you enough for being our moderator. All of our guests. I am so privileged, as I echo Jody's words, you know, to be able to participate in this. Uh, conversation by being a listener i've learned so much i really take a lot of value away from this and i hope that all of you who joined us today have taken a lot of value away to this as well um i've been watching the comments believe me i've been going through them and seeing everyone's commentary and i wish that i could uh, speak loudly for you during the conversation but um I think that everybody touched on some great points and I, I don't even think that there's there's not time for questions because I really think that we covered it all. Um, you know, you guys really went there in all areas and I just think it was so valuable and I'm really appreciative that we have such strong voices that are amplifying other voices here in the community um, to be able to give them the opportunity to, to say what, you know, what they might not be able to. So I wanna thank you all for that. I'd like to thank Maple Ridge Inn Bed and Breakfast here in Renfrew for hosting us. This is a gorgeous location as you guys have been able to witness the entire time. Uh, We've got some wonderful sponsors who donated swag bags to us 
Uh, we've got Sunshine and Sweets, which is out here in Renfrew. We've got Farm Gate, which is out in Arnprior. We've got Sweet Sucra. I hope I'm saying your business name right, Amanda, who donated macaroons. We've got so many others. And of course, I'd like to thank the town of Renfrew. I'd like to thank the city of Pembroke, the town of Petawawa, uh, Renfrew County Community Futures Development Corporation, Paro Center for Women Enterprise in North Bay, who am I missing? Township of Laurentian Valley. And I think that's it. I do apologize if I forgot anybody else. Uh, Ottawa Valley Tourism Association. There we go. There was the last one. And again, I'd like to thank you, our listeners, our followers, our community for listening, for being a part of the conversation and for our panelists who shared their opinions, their personal stories and experiences and for being vulnerable, for speaking up for women in the Ottawa Valley. Thank you all for being here today. Ladies, thank you all for being here today. Bye. And we will be back soon. We will see you guys in May for our next event. So stay tuned. Be sure to follow OB Boss Babes Podcast, Ottawa Valley Women in Business, and me, because I'm always sharing lots of things that are going on too. Thank you so much.